theory claims that we all have these eight intelligences and uh, people differ from one another in their profile of intelligences and there's no necessary link between one intelligence and the other. It also is based on the assumption that we wouldn't have these intelligences if they hadn't been valuable in human evolution. Um, an example I like to use is that the we developed a naturalist intelligence so we knew what to eat and what not to eat and uh, to be able to pay attention to which animals to run away from and which animals to hunt uh, and of course which plants to eat and which ones. So that, I mean, there's a reason why we're sensitive to the world of nature. Now most of us, uh, particularly people who would watch this, are, they go to supermarkets and they don't have to um, know anything about the, the wild. But I think that the, the neural networks which evolved to help us get around in the savannas of East Africa 50,000 years ago, they're now being used for a consumer society and we decide which shoes to buy and which car to buy and we're looking at the same kinds of things that our ancestors did but we're doing it in terms of uh, walking through the mall rather than, rather than walking through uh, the, or running through the, the savanna and hoping we won't get you know, eaten by, by, by some, kind of a, some kind of a creature. Um, the as history unfolds, as cultures evolve, of course the intelligences which they value change. I would say until a hundred years ago, if you wanted to have higher education, linguistic intelligence what was, import was important. I teach at Harvard and 125 years ago, 150 years ago, the entrance exams were Latin, Greek, and Hebrew. Um, and if, for example, you, had, you were dyslexic, that would be very difficult because it would be hard for you to learn those languages, which are basically written languages. People don't uh, speak Greek when they, when they, learn, they learn ancient Greek. Um, then over the last century, clearly the logical mathematical intelligence is something we pay a lot of attention to, and the uh, linguistic intelligence is a little bit more of, a, of an option. Um, but once one looks at the world of occupations, uh, you know, we have hundreds of occupations, and uh, I think the reason that Dan Goldman's work on social and emotional intelligence has got so much attention is because while your, your IQ, which is sort of language logic, will get you behind the desk, if you don't know how to deal with people, if you don't know how to re read yourself, you know, you're, you're going to end up just staying at that desk forever or eventually being asked to make room for somebody who does have social or emotional intelligence. And when the singularity occurs and the machines are smarter than we are, then it's the artistic kinds of intelligence uh, or intelligence used artist artistically to be more precise, which will come to the fore. I think you can talk about reformism in two senses. One is it's clear that when I developed this theory in, in the late 1970s, I was trying to reform the way psychologists and other people think about intelligence. So certainly I had an iconoclastic or reformist inclination there. And I was kind of surprised, one, that the psychologists didn't all line up in a row and say, you're right, we've been wrong for a hundred years. Um, that's somewhat facetious. But I was surprised at how much interest there was within the educational world. And there, I would say, gradually, um, I switched from simply saying, this is how I think the mind is organized and how it has developed, to I think maybe there are things we should do things differently in education because of the theory. And then really in the last 15 years, I think I've become much more reformist because I've been concerned about the ethical dimensions of our society. That doesn't grow in any natural way out of multiple intelligences theory. Um, if, we, if I look at it somewhat autobiographically, as a young person I was very much involved with music. Uh, I was a serious pianist and while I never thought about a career in music, music was and has been very important to me. And then when I got to college, I became interested in the other art forms, and then I spent a year in, in England as a fellow, and I really immersed myself in drama, that's great to do in theater, in, in London, and, and art galleries, and so I've expanded my artistic uh, horizons. And then when I be went to graduate school in psychology, I was stunned at how the arts were never mentioned. To be a developed person cognitively meant to be a scientist and to think scientifically. And we could speculate about why that's so. But the first serious book I wrote was called The Arts and Human Development. And what I said in that book, this is in the early 70s, is all developmental psychology has thought of science as the apotheosis of human development. 
Yet science is a modern Western invention, and you know, we might well never have invented science and if you had no Galileo and Copernicus and Newton. On the other hand, arts exist in just about every society, and they're very important. So can we conceptualize development in terms of the arts as well as the, as the sciences? Nowadays, nobody takes extreme positions on that issue. Uh, maybe someday the press will learn not to take extreme positions on the issue. Um, and uh, I certainly believe that every intelligence has a genetic component. Um, how else would it exist? And every intelligence has a certain heritability. That's the technical term for how much of the variation in the population has to do with who your, I always say, with who your biological grandparents were, because uh, that's a better set of genes than your parents, because you've got four sets rather than, than two. We don't know what the heritability is of most intelligences, but from a lot of research we know that um, on the average um, human traits are about 0.5 heritable. So, you know, uh, that means that, uh, you know, genes make a big contribution, but so do parents, culture, the media, peers, and so on. Um, I guess I've never put it this way before, but maybe what I would say is, you know, the intelligences that you favor are probably ones where you have a genetic predisposition. But how you use those intelligences is going to be overwhelmingly determined by the culture in which you're born and your parents and what they value and whether you get along with your parents and that kind of thing. So the deployment of intelligences is probably largely a nurture factor. But, you know, if, say, you know, Bach, the Bach family had a lot of genes going for it in the music area and probably, you know, that was pretty, pretty, pretty likely that they were going to end up being musicians even if they hadn't if, even if they'd been, so to speak, separated at birth and they'd been raised in another kind of family. And the first thing I would say is that life isn't fair, and some people are going to be strong in a lot of intelligences, and some people aren't. Um, I think of the intelligence as a set of computers. And if you wanted to summarize my theory in a sentence, we used to think there was just one general computer in here, and if you were good at one thing, you'd be good at everything, and if you were lousy, you'd one thing. So kind of smarter across the board, stupid across the board. I think the the step I took, I would call it an advance, is you can be very smart with language, average with music, lousy with understanding other people, or vice versa. There's no necessarily correlation between the two. But I think stupid has two very different connotations. One is that your computer isn't very good. Um, for example, I'm very, not biologically very good spatially, but the truth is with a map and a, and a position uh, you know, a determiner and a, you know, a some uh, special attention to the environment, I can do perfectly, perfectly well. But I suppose if there were a test of spatial intelligence, I wouldn't do very well. So one meaning for stupid is it takes you a long time to do what it takes other people who are smarter in that intelligence. I mean, I'm very musical, especially when I was younger. I heard something once. Not only didn't, could I remember it, I couldn't forget it. And so that's smart in a kind of a, 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 a technical sense. But the other sense of stupid, which I think is much more important, is how do you go about leading your life? Uh, you know, do you know what you're trying to do? Can you achieve it? When you make a mistake, do you make the same mistake again? Or do you uh, um, simply stick in a rut? Um, and you know, that has to do with your own understanding of yourself, what you're trying to achieve, what I call intrapersonal intelligence. And I'd much rather to have somebody who was stupid in the first sense but had a good sense about how to negotiate their way through life than somebody who had the computers going full blast but kept uh, knocking their head against the wall. I make fun of Mensa. I don't know a great deal about Mensa. That's the high IQ group. But I say, you know, to get into Mensa, you have to have a high IQ. And once you get in, you spend your time congratulating people who are in Mensa with you. To me, that's a pretty stupid way to spend your life. I'm not going to give a course in American history, but we've had periods of greed, and we've had periods which were much more generous. Um, and I think we are certainly have been in a period of incredible greed, um, I think certainly dating back 20 or 30 years. That's not going to be changed overnight. Um, what I, my perception is that what societies do um, is a co-occurrence of a set of ideas which are developed usually by thinkers, uh, um, by think tanks, and with charismatic leaders who can bring about those changes. So 
to use things which most people could have access to. I mean, Franklin Roosevelt built very much on the ideas of the progressive, progressive era, which were developed in the teens. Uh, and then people like uh, Barry Goldwater, Ronald Reagan, Newt Gingrich built very much on the neoconservative ideas which were developed by William F. Buckley in, in the, uh, his uh, National Review and other such thinkers in the 1950s and 60s. Um, what I'm hoping is that uh, uh, some genuinely progressive ideas, some general liberal ideas, ideas, for example, of social entrepreneurship, which have you know, grown enormously in the last 10 or 20 years, will intersect with a president who not only totally gets it, but has a, a generous dollop of, of charisma. I think what we're realizing now is that this is a significant part of the population, tends to be more Republican than anything else, who would rather destroy the presidency and the president than come to, come to some kind of an, uh, a belief that the, the country can and should be, should be different. Um, but it's a huge educational effort, education not just in the sense I do it, but in terms not only of government, but of uh, private leaders, of philanthropists, uh, um, opinion leaders, and uh, folks like me who are in the trenches and are not going to be up there on the stage, but who believe in this and try to, try to work on it. And uh, uh, Thomas Friedman, who writes a lot about this, uh, clearly is searching for a mission for the United States, because the United States has been essentially the world leader um, in the last century in terms of, uh, of, of policies and of uh, role models. Um, and he, I think he realizes that now a lot of the things we stand for is exactly what the world doesn't want and doesn't need. Um, I think if Obama doesn't succeed, uh, hopefully he will serve two terms, he'll be alive, hopefully he'll try. If he doesn't succeed, I think it's going to be, I think it means the United States will be finished as a, as a moral force in the world. And maybe that's okay. Uh, after all, I'm not running for office, so uh, I don't think the United States is exceptional, and I don't think it has to be the moral leaders. I think that not only have countries like Denmark and Sweden that I know the best worked out the best kind of balance of um, individual initiative, creativity, entrepreneurship, with some kind of a concern not only about the country but the rest of the world, um, but the people there are much happier. And I would love for someone to do a detailed study of the United States, and particularly the people who are, I'm going to call the destroyers, to see what kind of understandings they really have of the other possibilities. I'd love to know how many Americans have given the choice of one in a million becoming a trillionaire, but actually much more likely at the age of 55, losing the job, not being able to get another one, and would matter what their insurance is, the first time something bad happens, they get bankrupt, or making a little bit less money making somewhat higher taxes, but knowing that their kids will have a decent education, that there's a safety net. I'd like to know how many people would really rather choose the first, because I don't know. Um, I will say something which was a shock to me and shows that I'm very much out of the mainstream. Uh, some years ago, I wrote an article for Foreign Policy. They said, how could we change things for the better? And I know they wanted me to write about education, but I'm a free country, happily, so I wrote about what I wanted, and I said, the average uh, household makes about $40,000 a year. I think that nobody in America should be allowed to keep more than $4 million a year, 100 times as much. They can make as much as they want, but anything above $4 million, they either have to give back to the government or they have to set up a charity. Then I said, well, people make money for no more than 50 years, so let's multiply uh, $4 million a year by 50, and we get to $200 million. I said, no American should be allowed to pass on to their progeny more than 200 million. Again, they can make 200 trillion, but everything beyond that 200 million, a sizable sum, I think we would agree, ought either to go to back to the government or in some kind of a 501c3 philanthropy. I could not believe the guff I got from people who are wealthy, people who are average, and truck drivers and cab drivers. They all hated it because somehow I made it, it's mine, and no one can take it away from me. That's insane. It's insane in any analysis, and yet I think that's what we have breathed in in our air, probably to some extent over hundreds of years, but certainly in that toxic uh, uh, Reagan, Gingrich. What did Reagan say? Um, government is not the solution, it's the problem. Uh, uh, we're, that, that's, that's, the, that's the stuff we've been, sn we've been sniffing. It, it, isn't, it isn't marijuana. It's, uh, it's, it's that markets can do no wrong.
I've never met Obama. I don't know whether I ever will. But if I had uh, 90 seconds with him in an elevator, this is what I would say. Uh, Mr. President, American society has been dominated by the three M's, money, markets, and me. And especially the young, the best and the brightest, the students that I work with, they want to be rich. They believe totally in the market, even though that's a very complicated thing, and it's all about me. We have to switch them, first of all, 90 degrees to the three E's, um, which I hope will be visible on the camera, <laughs> excellence, engagement, and ethics. That's what I call good work. Good workers are people who know what they're doing, are engaged in it, and try to do it in a responsible way. And then we flip the E, another 90 degrees to W for we. You can't ask other people to be good workers unless you do it yourself. And joining together to do good work is the replacement for money markets and me and the way that we spread excellence, engagement, and ethics. I think that one of the good features about the United States, since I've been bashing it, is that uh, it's built into our DNA to take a chance, and if we fail, to try again. Um, and that's why, with the good and the bad, Hollywood, Wall Street, and Silicon Valley all over the world are icons, particularly for young people, particularly young people with ambition. And I can remember back uh, 30 years or so ago, I had a steady stream of people from East Asia, Chinese, Korean, uh, uh, and Japanese, saying, we want to be creative. Tell us the 23 steps to being creative. In order, please. And I kept saying it doesn't work that way. Basically, I don't think I had the word startup. I said, you've got to try something out. Try to get some other people to support you. And if it doesn't work, what, what can you learn from it? So I think it's, it's, in our, it's in our national DNA. But creativity is completely neutral. It can be used. To, I mean, Osama bin Laden is very creative, and he's changed the history of the world. But I'm, I don't think we really want to engender more um, uh, Osama bin Ladens. Uh, Bill Gates is, uh, is very creative, but uh, 20 years ago, a lot of us were pretty critical about him. And I think, uh, so to speak, he has redeemed himself by what he's done with his, with his, with his resources. So to me, it's, it's really wetting our, uh, let's say, the, the societal DNA for taking a chance with uh, doing, doing something in a responsible way. One thing we have learned, though, from our research recently with young people, and it's kind of a surprise to me, and these are, again, rather privileged young people, is they're quite risk-averse. Um, and this is especially in school. They want to know what's required of them, what's the right answer. Uh, they don't want to take any chances there. And I even wonder if you take a look at Wall Street and the, the uh, major peccadilloes of the, uh, the last uh, 10 years or so, whether the young people were kind of getting signals from their bosses about what What's, what they're supposed to do and what they can do. Um, so that's a, that's a rather different view of creativity than Thomas Edison uh, alone in his lab, uh, you know, coming, coming up with new ideas and, and trying them out. So I, I guess what this, what this uh, soliloquy is, is convincing me of is creativity isn't kind of a fixed entity over the time and over the, over the milieu. And uh, clearly the, the secret is to is to bottle up what, what we've done well, um, but not to assume that it's going to be done exactly. Creativity used to be sitting alone in a garret in Paris um, or tinkering with your test tubes um, in New Jersey or being a patent officer in, in Bern, Switzerland. And now it's global. And how that takes place when everybody's connected to everybody else, when any artwork can be initially uh, not only transmitted, but morphed and photoshopped and flickered and uh, messed, messed around and so on. When we, we need to have different analytic tools than we had in the days of solitary creativity. What's interesting in our own studies, we have what we call the Good Play Project, which is about kids and, and computers, is that every child, every young person is wired now, and most um, older people as well, um, the overwhelming uh, use is either social networking, which is basically hanging around the, the front of school, but doing it now 24-7, uh, wherever you are. Um, gaming, some games are intellectually challenging, but a lot of them are just, uh, uh, can you get the other guy before uh, he gets you? They're usually guys. Um, then, and here I'm talking about the work of Mimi Ito in particular, uh, there's some what we call messing around, where people have 
ideas and interests and pursue them a bit, but the way in my day I would have read a book about something and talked to some people and read gone another way. And then there, there's uh, you know, what, what's called geeking or geeking out, people getting seriously interested in things. And that's still a small percentage of the population, whether it's bigger than before, uh, I, mean, I, I, I can't judge. And the, uh, I am old enough to have lived through the promises, the educational promises of radio, television, the film strip, <laughs> uh, DVDs, uh, CDs, and so on. Of course, school hasn't changed very much. I do believe that the new digital media will change education radically, and they'll change workplace radically. A book that I just read on wiki government by Simone Novak argues very persuasively that in things like giving a patent, um, we can make use of expertise in the population. And in fact, it's probably imperative because there are way too many applications and the patent office is overwhelmed and it takes years for it to make a decision. And then they almost always say yes because they don't have a good argument to say no. Now, if you simply were to post an idea for an invention and let everybody in the world say whether it should be patented, that's nonsense because 99% of the people would have no idea about how to analyze it and wouldn't have the knowledge to know whether it was original or not. So the idea of wiki government, and it seems to work in the patent area, is that people have to be technical enough to be able to read the stuff and to be able to comment um, in an appropriate way and ultimately, raters themselves will be rated the way they are on eBay. So if, if John Smith pipes up all the time, but what he has to say is nonsense, he gets a very low rating. And the decision in the end is made by the U.S. Patent Office, and they see which people to pay attention to and which not. That seems to me, uh, on the face of it, to be a plan worth taking seriously. On the other hand, all you would need to have three multinationals who decide to corrupt the process by pretending to fakery, the way many people on the left and the right have thousands of emails sent to a political candidate, and if the political candidate isn't sharp, they think it's their, um, their own constituents rather than you know, IBM or whatever paying for it. Uh, you know, they, gaming the system is not going to uh, disappear just because some people have a good idea of how to use lay expertise. Well, I'll give an honest answer. Number one is I sleep very well. Uh, Number two, I'm much more likely to be kept up by family kinds of problems, especially ones which I think that I should be able to solve than I can, than by, uh, by cosmic problems. But what gets me to work each day, um, and I think that's the deeper question that you're asking, is um, whether there's anything that I can do in any particular role to nudge upward the, uh, the amount of good work that's done, work that's excellent engaging and ethical. And I made a big decision uh, five or six years ago to begin to work much more with young students, secondary students, college students, trying to get them to think about ethical issues at a time when they aren't already uh, having to hit a payroll and do what the boss says. And I'm still feeling my way. I've worked at three uh, colleges and uh, my team has worked at many, many secondary schools uh, all over the world. And I wouldn't at all say that we've discovered the magic way of doing it, but I'm, I'm a great believer that people cannot um, deal with any kind of complex issue unless they've had to engage it, think about it, discuss it, role play, and so on. And uh, uh, when I began the Good Work Project with my colleagues, one of them, Bill Damon, said, if I could cure cancer, Bill said I would. He said, I can't. I think working in good work is the most important thing that I can do. And I agree with him. I think that's the most important thing that I can do. And I try to use every venue, including this one, to uh, raise people's consciousness about it. Um, I mean, the problem prehistorically was people could be very bad workers and they could destroy their society, but the rest of the planet would survive. But now we're, all, we're in it all together, uh, you know, whether it's you know, disease or money or human beings. You circulate all around the world. Uh, somebody who wants to do mischief could destroy the planet, uh, could destroy all the people on it. And unless we develop the good work muscle uh, regionally, locally, nationally, and, and internationally, there won't be a planet. Well, that's pretty easy because whenever I describe IQ tests, I say that IQ tests take, have a combination of language and logic. And if you do well in language and logic, if you can combine them, you'll have a high IQ. 
And I say, that's a selector for who will be a law professor. And I then mentioned Bill Clinton, Hillary Clinton, and Barack Obama, who all three of whom were law professors, and clearly they have the IQ kind of intelligence. Um, it's absolutely clear to me that uh, Obama has enormous intrapersonal intelligence. His book, um, Dreams of My Father, is an amazing book. And it's obvious that everybody has lots of intrapersonal intelligence. But here's the, here's the big question we don't know. And that is, um, what is his existential intelligence like? The existential intelligence is one that I use kind of playfully. And that's the interest in big questions. Uh, there's no doubt that he's interested in these himself. But it's not clear to what extent he's such a pragmatist that he will lose that sense of mission, that bigger story. John Kennedy really achieved nothing practically as president, but he had enormous power to excite people, to motivate them to think differently. And that's why we still remember him you know, 50 years after the fact. And um, uh, I'm not sure, speaking now in uh, September of 2009, whether the existential intelligence, which Obama clearly has in his own life, is something that he can mobilize more. Uh, I mean, you know, Ronald Reagan was able to mobilize that. I don't like what he did, but there was no question that, that he helped people think about meaning. And we thought that Obama could, but it's, uh, it, it's just not clear at this point. Derek Bach, who was the president of Harvard, used to have this quote, I don't know that it's original with him, which is, if you think education is expensive, try estimating the cost of ignorance. And uh, uh, the truth is, until a century or so ago, um, you know, formal education for the elite was fine, um, but there was really no need to educate the mass of society, at least beyond the, the basic literacies. But now it, it's completely obvious that unless people are not only educated to a higher level, but want to continue to learn, actually motivated to continue to learn, don't feel it's a gun to their head, um, that they will not be very useful to themselves or to their society. Um, the problem is that a small proportion of the population gets a very good education. As a shorthand, I would say the international baccalaureate crowd, which is a kind of education which uh, elites are able to get, whether or not they belong to the IB. Um, but of course, that's expensive education, and it presupposes a lot of parental and teacher support in large parts of the world. That's just not, not a practical reality. Um, and that's why people who are in policy, which I don't think about much more macro things, ranging from you know, one laptop per child toward making sure that uh, you know, women are able to go to school, to uh, um, uh, ensuring that uh, the country isn't last on some kind of international comparison. And we can't think about education in that as, as, if it's were, as if it were just one thing. My focus has been on um, educational aspirations, but that's an ideal. And uh, I'm quite aware that it's easier to achieve at uh, you know, Phillips Academy Andover than it is in a one-room schoolhouse in Bangladesh with 60 kids and not enough food to eat. And if I can close with one sentence, uh, I think the the, the major problem with the No Child Left Behind policy, which is a completely bipartisan policy, is it uses the country to solve the problems of inner city Detroit or D.C., and that's just mixing apples and oranges. Um, the way I've put it is the problem in the inner city is excellence. The problem in the heartland is engagement. The problem among the elites is ethics.